yearly I will begin inshallah Okay Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wal mursaleen Muhammadin wa ala ahli baytih al-atyabin al-atharin Allahum salla ala Muhammad wa ahli Muhammad I hope you are all keeping well as with last week, inshallah, we'll go for about half an hour, then we'll take a, a few minutes break, and then we'll continue again, inshallah. And as as with last week, you know, the, the topic of our discussion, inshallah, is, is the social political role of the Ahlul Bayt, salamullahi alayhim ajma'een. Inshallah, we hope this is a, a gathering which I appreciate and thank you for taking the time to come and attend it. Inshallah, it is something that Allah Ta'ala accepts and is pleased with. We have a hadith that say that to get together and to rem- remember the Ahlul Bayt are gatherings that are loved by the Ahlul Bayt themselves. Alayhim salam inshallah, this is one of them. Feel free to at any time uh, send a chat. If you send a chat message, I will see it. If you have any comments or questions, do feel free to do that inshallah. As we said last week, the the and the slides are clear, right? Everybody can see the whole slide. I hope. As we said last week, the uh, the plan is, inshallah, to discuss to try and extract the social political role of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam from their different interactions using a hadith. And so last week we looked in particular at some of the ahadith of the imams alayhim salam with the khulafa. And my, intentionally my focus has been more on the imams starting from the fourth imam onwards. Because to a certain extent we are more familiar with the political role of the first few imams up to Sayyid al-Shuhada alayhi salam. So looking more from the fourth imam onwards we were looking at the interactions between the fifth imam and Hisham the sixth Imam in Mansur, the seventh Imam in Harun al Rashid. Today, inshallah, we want to look a bit more at some of the ahadith that illustrate the interaction between the Imams and the Shia community. How the Imams were growing and training the Shia community. And like I said, inshallah, if we have the opportunity in the springtime, we will mention some very interesting points about the Imams with the scholars, the other ulama who are supporting the Banu Umayyah or the Banu Abbas, what was the strong stance that the Imams took against them? Similarly, we'll talk about poets, for example, Shia poets and their important role in spreading the message of the Ahlul Bayt and how the Imams really supported them. And lastly, we'll talk about revolutionaries and Imam Zadez who rose up and fought and how a lot of times they have been unfairly judged by the Shia community, whereas in many cases the truth is that the Imams were supporting these revolutionaries. I want to recap some of the main concluding points that we tried to derive from last week's session. We said that the Imams والسلام, are entrusted with two different responsibilities. One of them is what we are more familiar with, that they have to present the religion and explain the religion. They have to teach which even we'll talk about today a little bit. But another aspect of the role of the imam is to lead the Muslim society. We have a hadith in, in Nahj al-Balagha where Imam Ali, when he's talking about the khawarij, the khawarij, they had a statement where they said there is no leader except for Allah. And Imam Ali said, okay, and theoretically that's right, but what they're trying to use that statement for is, is wrong. At the end of the day, every group needs a leader. La Buddha linnasi min Amir. This was the statement of Amir al Mu'minin. And so, obviously, one of the roles of the Imam is to continue that role of the Holy Prophet and lead the Muslim society towards perfection. Take the whole society together towards the servitude of Allah. And then, when we see that the Imams were deprived that right and their right was usurped from them we may have been led to believe that they just sat down and and changed their job and did something else. They worked on other areas. Whereas, no, that's very wrong. The reality is this, that every one of the imams, depending on the reality of the situation they lived in, they were trying to fix the society. 
by fix the society, I mean they were trying to take back that right for themselves. They were trying to prepare the grounds to one day establish a true Islamic just society. And it, it is this reason why we need to really ponder upon this point that why were all of the Imams under extensive pressure from the Banu al-Abbas, from the Banu Umayyah? Why, why were they all one by one imprisoned, exiled, put under close watch by the Khulafa, and then at the end killed? We have in one hadith that I've written here, ما منا إلا مقتول أو مسموم There is not one from amongst us except that he was killed or poisoned. This is the situation whereas there were many, many other ulama at that time. As we will see in the, in the spring session if we continue, inshallah, there were many ulama who were on uh, the payroll of the government, who were supported by the government. Why was it that other ulama like Zuhri or Ukrama or other famous figures in, in Sunni fiqh and Sunni history, why is it that the Khulafa had no problem with them? Was it a matter of Shiaism versus Sunniism just in terms of theologic, theological belief? No, that would be a very naive kind of judgment to make. The reality was that those Khulafa, many of them, they didn't care the least bit about religion. All they cared about was their own throne and their own power. They were very, very strong and capable leaders ruthless, brutal tyrants, but they were able to lead. Look at somebody like Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid has been recognized in history as an astute statesman. So somebody like Harun, if we see that he has issues with Imam Kazim alayhi salam, if we see that he is willing to put Imam Kazim in prison, kill Imam Kazim, as we will see, this was something that was very dangerous for him because the Shia community at the time of Imam Kazim was huge and powerful. So if he was willing to do that, it indicates that there was an intense political struggle happening between the Ahlul Bayt and these unjust rulers. Another thing to keep in mind is that we should look at all of the Imams as one Nur of Allah, one person that continued the same mission. One after one, they were passing the baton after the other. You know, in, in like a race in the Olympics, you have those people that make, do run a marathon together, one of them has to pass the baton onto the other. It's the same thing here. All of them are trying to reform the society. All of them are trying to take the mu'mineen and the Muslims and the whole world towards servitude of Allah. When one of them dies, the next one continues. An interesting point that really illustrates this very beautifully is that we have a hadith that say the following, that if you ever forget who was uh, if you want to say a hadith and you forget which imam that hadith was from it's no problem at all you could just say the name of another imam if you had if you are saying a, a hadith from the fifth imam alayhi salam and you go and say that oh the sixth imam said this it's fine because they are all the same at the end of the day they are all the infallible ma'asum representative of allah and so, you know, my conclusion that I really want to, inshallah, pass on to you, dear brothers and sisters that we mentioned last week, is that unfortunately the Shia community has misunderstood these imams in many cases. This is what I believe. I open the floor if you guys also, if you have any comments, if you disagree with what I'm saying, feel free to put something in the chat. But I want to say that those khulafa like Harun and Mansur, unfortunately, to a certain extent, they understood the Imams better than many of the Shias today are understanding the Imams. They understood that those Imams, if they got the chance, they would have taken over the rulership for themselves. They understood that these Imams were a threat to their throne. But unfortunately, many of the Shia community today, when they think of Imam Sajjad, what did they think of? They think of somebody who is busy fasting and praying and doing dua in Medina, Somebody who, because of the political situation, he left aside any political responsibility. And he just sat down and worshipped Allah. No, oh, this is very, very far from the truth. As I put in this Google Maps image on this slide, just because somebody is going in one direction for a little bit of time, this doesn't mean that they've forgotten about their destination. You guys see this Al-Mustafa International University? So Google Maps, if you were to want to go to Al-Mustafa International University from my house here in Qom, you would have to go down this route, make a U-turn at one point. 
So we shouldn't be naive and say that, oh, look, Imam Qadim was working in this way, Imam Sajjad was working in this way. No, they were all working towards the same goal. Ahsant, Ahsant, very good point. One of the mu'mineen is saying that even people think about our maraja in the same way that they are working towards different goals. Okay, so inshallah today, like I said, my goal is to talk about the imam and their shia. I want to divide this into three portions. First of all, I'm going to give a few ahadith and a few stories to kind of uh, look at how difficult the situation was for the Shia community, in particular after the tragedy of Karbala. And then in the second second group of ahadith, we want to look at how the Imam was slowly training the Shia community, building up the Shia community, increasing the numbers of the Shia community. And then we'll save one story for the very end, inshallah, which is a little bit different. Again, I want to just make one point that you know, this is just a very short amount of time we have together. This is not a time in which we could summarize the entire social political role of the Ahlul Bayt. Of course, it's much, much greater than what we can even imagine or try to talk about in this short time. But inshallah, this, will, this little bit will be beneficial. Okay, so first of all, we start with the difficulties that the Shia community was going through. After the tragedy of Karbala, the Shia community was absolutely destroyed. In fact, after Karbala, you may have seen the videos of Mukhtar. There was another event that happened where a group in Kufa under Mukhtar and before Mukhtar even, they rose up. Many, many of them were killed. Basically, Imam Sajjad, alayhi salam, we can say in some ways he goes through the most difficult period of all of the Imams in that he had very, very few supporters. Let me look at a few of the, uh, the hadith, two of the hadith that say that, and then we'll, we'll just comment on them. In this hadith over here, it says, And then it gives the names. It says that after Imam Hussein, السلام, all of the people became murtad. Everybody left the religion except for three people. Abu Khalid, وَيَحْيَىٰ ibn أُمْ طَوِيلٍ وَجُبَيْرٍ bin مُطْعِمٍ Three of the companions of Imam Sajjad, whose names are given. And then it says, ثُمَّ إِنَّ النَّاسِ لَحِقُوا وَكَثَرُوا So initially there was very, very few people. Only three people, it says, were left who didn't leave the religion. Now we'll comment on that. What does that mean? What does that mean that all of them became murtad, all of them left the religion except for three? But an interesting point is this, that it says, ثُمَّ إِنَّ النَّاسِ لَحِقُوا وَكَثَرُوا That afterwards, more and more people joined and the numbers increased. So we see that after the Shia community, before I make these comments, let's just read the next hadith as well. The next one is from the fourth Imam. He says, يَقُولُ مَا بِمَكَّةَ وَالْمَدِينَ عَشْرُونَ رَجُلًا يُحِبُّنَا That in all of Mecca and Medina, there are not even 20 people who love us. Very interesting. We see that there's very, very few people who are left in the Shia community after Karbala. So the analysis that I want to say to understand this hadith, in particular the first one, but even the second one, is this. That it wasn't the case that there were only 20 people who really loved the Imams. There were not only three people who really had remained in the religion and everybody else had become muratad. No, of course not. There were still many, many Muslims. The entire land was a Muslim land. And who is there in the Muslim community that doesn't love Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? Okay, we'll come to some examples of people who are really hate, hater, uh, haters and people who hate the Ahlul Bayt. But generally, it's not the case that the numbers were so small. So what do these ahadith mean then? How do we understand these kind of ahadith? What do we understand them to mean is that the imams were working towards a certain goal. They had a certain kind of mission that they wanted their shias to be carrying out. And there was nobody left to do that for them. There was nobody left to actually go and work towards the goals of the imams, help the imam who had the bravery to stand up in that oppressive time and support the Imam openly. 
We can kind of understand that by the end of the same hadith that we have before you, the first hadith. So I mentioned that the hadith started off by saying everybody became murtad, everybody left the religion except for three people. One of them, his name was Um At-Tawil, or Yahya ibn Um At-Tawil. The end of this hadith goes on to say that Kana Yahya ibn Um At-Tawil yadkhul masjid Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa yaqul he used to openly say, and he would come to the masjid of the Holy Prophet in Medina, and he would openly announce with those words of Ibrahim السلام, in the Quran, Kafarna bikum wa bada baynana wa baynakum al wal baghda. That we have disbelieved in you. O oh, oh you Muslims who are no longer supporting your Imam, O oh you who have just gone with the Banu Umayyah, I am announcing that I am disassociating myself from you. So we see that these people who remain in these, these numbers, these small numbers that the Imams are talking about, were those core Shias who were really people who were not just believing in their heart, but people who were willing to act. You know, I, I'm a very good question. I don't want to comment on that. I'm not even too sure. I'm not even too sure. There is discussions about Mukhtar. A, a lot of people, that the way the movie has portrayed him in a very good light, I think that is perhaps the common opinion that a lot of the Shia communities do, that a lot of the ulama have uh, a good understanding of Mukhtar and the work that he did. So I'm not too sure how we reconcile that. But but basically what these ahadith, regardless, there's no doubt that these ahadith are telling us that there were very, very few Shias who were actually there to bravely work for the Imams. Okay. So... Uh, why, why was the situation so difficult? Why was it that there were so few people? This, I, I think we know why. We've heard about the level of oppression that the Shia community was faced with after Karbala. Let me just give you one very interesting story, very, very telling story that gives us a, an idea of what kind of a world that was at that time. So one of the very ruthless governors of the Banu Umayyah was somebody by the name of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. That same, that same individual that we just read about, Yahya bin Um Tawil, he, uh, the one who went to the Prophet's mosque and announced his bara'a from the people, he was very, very brutally killed by Hajjaj. Hajjaj killed many, many Shias. He was a horrible person. So this story is very interesting. One day somebody comes before Hajjaj and he speaks to Hajjaj a little bit rudely. And Hajjaj gets very upset with him. فَأَغْلَضَ لَهُ الْحَجَّاجِ فِي الْجَوَابِ Hajjaj gets upset. They're like, how dare you talk to me like this? And then this man who's before Hajjaj, he says, لَا تَقُلْ هَذَا أَيُّهَا الْأَمِيرِ Oh Amir, don't talk to me in this rude way. First he had been rude, then Hajjaj got very upset. So, so he's telling Hajjaj, no, don't get upset. Don't be like this. فَلَا لِقُرَيْشْ وَلَا لِثَقِيفْ مَنْقَبَ يَعْتَدُّونَ بِهَا إِلَّا وَنَحْنُ نَعْتَدْ بِمِثْلِهَا He says, oh Hajjaj, there is no fazilat, there is no good characteristic that you and the Quraysh and your, your tribe of Thaqif have except that we also have it. So now Hajjaj asks this man that what is your manqaba? What is your traits? What are your good traits? And one by one, this man begins to announce what his good traits are. He says, ما ينقص عثمان ولا يذكر بسوء في نادينا قط Never has Uthman ever been insulted or remembered in an ill way in our gatherings. Hajjaj is happy. He says, oh, this is a manqaba. He says, ما رؤيا منا خارجي Nobody from us has ever rebelled against the government. Again, Hajjaj is very happy. He says, oh wow, that's really a manqaba. That's a good characteristic that you have. Then the man goes on. وَمَا شَهِدَ مِنَّا مَعَا أَبِي تُرَاب مَشَاهِدَهُ إِلَّا رَجُلٌ وَاحِدْ فَأَسْقَطَهُ ذَلِكَ عِنْدَنَا He said, that nobody from amongst our tribe ever joined Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. He used the word Abu Turab to put down Amir al-Mu'mineen. Nobody from our tribe ever joined Amir al-Mu'mineen in his wars except for one man. And because of that, we disregard him and he lost his position in our eyes. Again, Hajjaj is very happy. Then he says, وَمَا أَرَادَ مِنَّا رَجُلٌ قَطْ أَنْ يَتَزَوَّجْ إِمْرَأَةً إِلَّا سَأَلَ عَنَهَا 
هل تحب أبا تراب أو تذكره بخير فإن قيل إنها تفعل ذلك اجتنبها فلم يتزوجها He says no man from our tribe ever wanted to marry a woman except that first he would ask does she love Amir al-Mu'mineen does she remember Amir al-Mu'mineen in a good way if so he wouldn't marry her Again, Hajjaj is very happy. He says, oh wow, what a good manqaba, what a good trait that you have. He goes on, ما ورد فينا ذكر فسمي عليا ولا حسنا ولا حسين ولا ولدت فينا جارية فسميت فاطمة He said, nobody in our tribe is called Ali or Hassan or Hussein or Fatima. Again, Hajjaj is very happy. He says, wow, what a good trait. Last thing, he says, a woman from our tribe نظرت امرأة منا حين أقبل الحسين إلى العراق إن قتله الله أن تنحر عشر جزر A woman from our tribe she made another that if Allah kills Hussein she will she will basically sacrifice ten animals ten camels I think and then she abided by her another Anyways I just want to show you that this was the level of animosity that the, the leadership, the Banu Umayya, and later on the Banu Abbas, Mutawakkil, these people were not any less than this. They were also, in fact, maybe worse than the Banu Umayya. So there was extreme, extreme pressure on the Shia community. To openly support the Imam was very dangerous. On the other hand, there was extensive rewards in the material sense to go with the flow to support the Banu Umayyah to support the Banu Abbas meant that you would be able to live a life of happiness and a life of wealth so in that situation we can imagine what the Imams are faced with that there is hardly any Shias left the oppression against the Shia community is so much and the temptation to not be a Shia is also so so strong so what do the Imams do with all of this What I want to say, of course, we can't, like I said in this short time, we can't do justice to this topic, but I want to show you a few stories to sh see how the Imams were training the Shia community, how they were building up the numbers of the Shia community. In one statement from Imam Sajjad, we see he's, he's trying to teach the Mu'mineen around him that, you know, don't just go after this dunya that the Banu Umayya are giving you. He says, Awala hurrun yada'u hadihi lumada li ahliha. He's saying, is there anybody, meaning the dunya, he said, is there anybody to leave this leftover morsel of food? There is no worth to your soul except for paradise. So do not sell it for anything less than that. Whoever is happy from Allah with this dunya, He's been shortchanged. He's, you know, he's thought he's happy with something that's very base and very humble and not worth anything. Anyways, you know, I, I can't go into more, and I'm sure you have heard a lot about these kind of stories about how the imams were teaching their students and training their students. Slowly, slowly, because of these blessed efforts of the imams, more and more people were attracted to the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. Especially during the time of the fifth Imam, the fifth Imam, and then later the sixth Imam, they were presented with an opportunity where the Banu Umayyah were very weak. They were busy fighting against the Banu Abbas. Again, initially when the Banu Abbas came into power for a little while, perhaps we could say, although last week I said something different in a way, but perhaps we can say that when the Banu Abbas came into power, there was still a little bit of ease on the Shia community. Because the Banu al-Abbas initially presented themselves as supporters of the Ahlul Bayt. So in particular during the time of the 5th Imam and the 6th Imam, they were able to really do a lot in terms of teaching the Shias and spreading the message of the Ahlul Bayt. Again on this bottom hadith that I brought on the slide, somebody, I think it's Abu, al Abu Hamza al-Thumali. I think so, I'm not sure. He's mentioning that I was in the mosque when I see the fifth Imam enter. وَحَوْلَهُ أَهَلُوا خُرَاسَانْ وَغَيْرُهُمْ يَسْأَلُونَهُ عَنْ مَنَاسِكِ الْحَجْ We see that the fifth Imam is teaching people about the ahkam of hajj. But what's very interesting is that the people who are talking to him are all the way from Khurasan. This is before Imam Rada has gone to Khurasan. It's the time of the fifth Imam. 
So we see that there are now Shias all, or people who are going to the Ahlul Bayt for their questions, people who have love of the Ahlul Bayt, not just in Medina, not just in Kufa, but all the way in Khurasan. So slowly, slowly the Shia community, because of these kind of efforts of Tarbiyah, is growing. Another very, very interesting story that we can really think about and see what the Imam was trying to do to spread the message of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam. The fifth Imam, he leaves a will to his son, the sixth Imam. The, the sixth Imam, alayhi salam, he narrates that قَالَ لِي أَبِي يَا, يَا جَعْفَرْ أَوْقِفْ لِي مِنْ مَالِي كَذَا وَكَذَا لِنَوَادِبْ تَنْدُبُنِي عَشْرَ سِنِينَ بِمِنَا أَيَّامَ مِنَا the fifth Imam, Imam Baqir alayhi salam, before he dies, he's telling Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam that keep aside some money that for 10 years in Hajj in the city of Mina, people should lament and cry over my death. Now why? Why does the Imam want people to do that? Obviously the Imam is ma'asum. The Imam is very far from wanting to be praised and, and you know, wanting status in this dunya. That's the likes of me and you who... You know, we're worried about what, whether people remember us, whether people cry for us, where people want, to, we want to look good basically in the eyes of the people. The Imam salam, is far from that. If the Imam wants people to remember him and cry over him, it's because he wants that message of the Ahlul Bayt, that message of the Wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt to spread. And what better venue, what more powerful venue to get that message out than the days of Hajj? where Muslims from everywhere are in the Hajj. We can imagine that if people are crying over Imam Baqir alayhi salam, they will also naturally ask, oh, how did he die? What, did he really die? Uh, 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 did somebody kill him? Was he poisoned? Who killed him? Why did they kill him? What was his message? Such questions, Imam, ja Imam Ja'far and Imam Baqir alayhi salam, they want that message to get out slowly, slowly. So they're using these kind of means. Another very interesting hadith, somebody narrates that I saw the sixth Imam on the day of Arafah in Hajj وَهُوَ يُنَادِي بِأَعْلَى صَوْتِهِ Without any fear, without any taqiyya, openly he's calling out in the days of Hajj أَيُّهَا nas, O people إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ كَانَ الْإِمَامِ The Holy Prophet was the Imam. This is a time when the Banu Umayyah are in charge. The Banu Umayyah obviously they are not they are not happy with this idea of the Ahlul Bayt being the Imam coming out, being spread. And Imam Sa'd, Sadiq salam, openly, he's announcing it in Hajj. That ثم كان علي بن أبي طالب ثم الحسن ثم الحسين ثم علي بن الحسين ثم محمد بن علي ثم ها ها means me, means أنا. Basically, in the loudest of his voice, he's announcing on the plains of Arafah that Imam Ali alayhi salam was the Imam after the Prophet. Then Hassan was the Imam. Then Hussein was the Imam. Then Ali ibn al Hussein was the Imam. Then Muhammad ibn Ali was the Imam. Then I am the Imam. Again and again, he is repeating this. He is saying it to the people in the front of him. He is saying it to the people on the right side. He is saying it to the people on the left side. So we see that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, they were spreading this message. They were spreading the truth about how they are the Imam. Another very, very interesting hadith. Somebody uh, comes to the sixth Imam السلام, and, and he says that I used to work for the Banu Umayyah. Is there any way that I can now be forgiven by Allah? فَاسْتَأَذَنْتُ لَهُ عَلَيْهِ فَأَذِنَا لَهُ فَلَمَّا أَنْ دَخَلَ سَلَّمَا وَجَلَسَ This man, he comes before the sixth Imam alayhi salam. He sits before the Imam. He says, جُعِلْتُ فِدَاك That, O oh, Imam, may I be sacrificed for you. إِنِّي كُنْتُ فِي دِيوَانِ هَأُولَاءِ الْقَوْمِ فَأَصَبْتُ مِنْ دُنْيَاهُمْ مَالًا كَثِيرًا وَأَغْمَضْتُ فِي مَطَالِبِهِ So he's basically saying, I used to work for the Banu Umayyah. I got a lot of money, I made a lot of wealth working for the Banu Umayyah. And so what does the Imam say to him? Does the Imam say that, oh, just do istighfar and inshallah Allah will forgive you? 
First, the imam takes a very strong stance that what you did was wrong. You should have never gone and worked for these oppressors. The imam says, and this is a very famous hadith that is mentioned in books of fiqh and in discussions of fiqh, they use this hadith. لَوْلَا أَنَّا بَنِي أُمَيَّا وَجَدُوا مَنْ يَكْتُبْ لَهُمْ وَيَجْبِي لَهُمُ الْفَيْءِ وَيُقَاتِلُوا عَنُهُمْ وَيَشْهَدُوا جَمَاعَتَهُمْ لَمَا سَلَبُونَا حَقَّنَا Very strong statement. Imam Sadiq tells this man that if only the Banu Umayyah had never found anybody who would write for them, anybody who would collect money for them, anybody who would fight for them, anybody who would come to their jama'a, their prayers of jama'a, they would not have been able to usurp our right. Later on, Imam Sadiq in this hadith, he shows this man what he needs to do to get the forgiveness of Allah. And it's a very beautiful story where at the end of his life, he tells his companion that Imam Sadiq has fulfilled his promise and he came to my aid at the end of my life. But that's the end of the story. I don't want to mention that, although it's very beautiful. But the important point is this, that Imam takes a very strong stance that what you did is wrong. Oh, Muslims, you should know that you're not allowed to work for the Banu Umayyah. If they didn't have anybody to work for them, they wouldn't be able to usurp our right from us. Okay, with that, inshallah, I'm going to take a break. It's become the prayer time here. Inshallah, in 5 to 10 minutes, I'll, I'll come back. Inshallah, translations can be added to the PowerPoint in the future. Inshallah, when it's uploaded onto the Academy's website, I'll try my best to put translations. Uh, with your permission, I'll just take a few minutes. In 5 to 10 minutes, let's say 10 minutes, I'll come back, inshallah. Thank <laughs> you. 
السلام عليكم everybody can hear me fine okay let's continue inshallah so what we did so far is we looked at some stories and ahadith to illustrate the difficulty that the Shia community was faced with especially after Karbala although this difficulty like I said continued Mutawakkil was the Khalifa during the time of the 10th or 11th Imam also he was extremely extremely brutal in his oppression to the Shias then we looked at some ahadith at how the Imams were working on training the Shia community teaching them the ma'arif of Islam, teaching them akhlaq, teaching them fiqh and also reminding them of their political responsibilities one last point I want to make about this hadith before us before we move on to the next section is that look, one of the things that the Imam said is that if the, if the Banu Umayyah didn't have people to support them and he starts to give examples of supporting them, writing for them, collecting money for them, fighting for them and attending their namaz e you see, namaz e itself, in its nature, it has this political dimension to it. That's really something worthy about pondering upon. Okay, the next section, uh, actually I have four sections before us. So we'd finish two of the sections. The third section that I want to now kind of show in, in two or three hadith is that the results of this blessed work of the imams, that the Shia community spread far and wide during the lives of the imams, Uh, just making sure you can still hear me, right? I got a message saying I've been disconnected. Everything's okay? Okay. The Shia community, as a result of these efforts of the Imam, the Shia community grew immensely. The time of the fifth and the sixth Imam was a time that was really, really important. And also the time of Imam al Rida alayhi salam. When Ma'amun la'anatullahi alayhi appointed Imam al Rida as the crown prince. As a result of that, the message of the Ahlul Bayt spread far and far into Iran. And many other Imam Zadis, children of the Imams, also came to Iran. And all of a sudden, we see that you know so many more people in that area were introduced to the Ahlul Bayt. So basically, the, the Shia Imams were growing the Shia community slowly, slowly. And because of that, we see very interesting things happening later on. In, in the times of the latter Imams. Uh, these slides are not changing for me. Uh, no. Sorry, one moment. Okay, so let's see. If... I don't know what slide can you guys see before you. I can only see number seven on my screen, but you can see number eight. Okay, khair, inshallah, that's fine. I have them before me on my phone. Okay, so the one before you now, the hadith, this is something that happened towards the time of the death of Imam al Qadam alayhi salam. So, what I want to show you is that. The Shia community has grown to be so much stronger and so much larger that in the very city of Baghdad where the Khalifa Harun lives, the Shia community is a threat now to Harun. That when he is killing Imam Qadim alayhi salam, he wants to pretend like nothing happened. In this story, it says this, that hmm, basically there's a Sunni alim who is narrating this hadith that that basically the person who used to take care, who was in charge of the prison of Imam Qadim alayhi salam was somebody called Sindhi ibn Shahak. The Sindhi ibn Shahak, he calls 80 people, 80 ulama apparently, and he tells them, yeah, 80 very well-known, very uh, reputable people, and they're told, يَا هَؤُلَاءَ أُنْظُرُوا إِلَى هَذَا الرَّجُلْ هَلْ حَدَثَ بِهِ حَدَثٌ فَإِنَّ النَّاسِ يَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّهُ قَدْ فُعِلَ مَكْرُوهٌ بِهِ That, O oh people, look at this man, referring to Imam Qadim alayhi salam. Look at Imam Qadim. Has anything happened to him? No, nothing has happened to him. People are saying something happened to him. 
وهذا منزله وفرشه موسع عليه غير مضيق look at the pillow look at the first the carpet he is sitting on look at his clothes he is being treated very well ولم يرد به امير المؤمنين سوءا امير المؤمنين referring to Harun he didn't want to give him any problems or trouble him and then the imam is still alive at this point the imam tells them that no this is not true i've been poisoned i'm going to die Basically, what I want to show is this, that these uh, Banu Umayya, Banu al-Abbas here, they were very scared of the Shia community. They didn't want this message to get out that Imam Kadim was killed. They wanted to hide the fact that he was killed. Now, inshallah, you have the ninth slide in front of you. Basically, again, I can't give you too much because of the lack of time. But the Shia community grew immensely. By the time of the latter Imams, we see a very strange situation where many, many cities, like I'll just read the names of some cities to you, such as Kufa, Baghdad, Nishapur, Qum, Ave, Ave is a place in Iran, Madain, Khurasan, Yemen, Ray, Azerbaijan, Samarra, Georgian, Basra. All of these are now strongholds of the Shia community. The Imam has different, different representatives that he writes letters to. He has a very organized system of wikala, where he has a wakil that he appoints. The wakil is in touch with him. He's sending letters to the wakil. He's receiving letters from the wakil. He's receiving money, khums money from the wakil. I'll just give you some stats to kind of get this, uh, try to inshallah understand this. The From the... Seventh Imam and the eighth Imam, alayhim salam If we wanted to count the total number of riwayat we have from them, it's about two thousand riwayat each. However, from the ninth Imam, the tenth Imam, and the eleventh Imam, it's much less. It's about four hundred riwayat each, because what had happened was the Imams themselves were put under a lot of pressure. They were they were not given freedom. However, from those 400 riwayat that we have from each one of the 9th, 10th, and 11th imam, about 30% of those riwayat were letters that they wrote. They used to write many letters, and many of these letters have reached us. They're narrated in Biharul Anwar or other books of hadith. Very interesting letters where, for example, the imam will be appointing a representative. He'll be telling somebody that this is my representative for Hijaz. If you have money, give the money to him. These kind of things were going on. So in this very interesting story that we have before us on the ninth slide, it's a, a story to do with Abu Muhammad, the 11th Imam, alayhi salam. Basically, this man called Dawood, he was the one who was in charge of the hammam of the 11th Imam. He used to like light. He was, he was somebody who worked for the 11th Imam, basically. He says that my master, the 11th Imam, called me and gave me a piece of wood that looked like it was like part of a door. It was like a long, round piece of wood. And he told me, go and give this to somebody else called Amri, one of my companions. So, okay, I agreed. And then he says, as I was going towards this person called Amri, there was somebody who was like a, a, a saqqa, somebody who was carrying water on their mule. They were in my way. And so I took that piece of wood and I hit the mule. And then all of a sudden it broke. Okay, it says, فَنَادَانِي السَّقَى السَّحَ عَلَى الْبَغَلْ فَرَفَعْتُ الْخَشَبَ He says, I raised the piece of wood. فَضَرَبْتُ الْبَغَلْ فَانْشَقَّتْ فَنَظَرْتُ إِلَى كَسْرِهَا فَإِذَا فِيهَا كُتُبْ He says that as that piece of wood broke, I looked at it and subhanAllah there were letters inside it. So I quickly hid it in my sleeve and I went back to the imam. And the imam, when he goes back, the imam reprimands him that, why did you do that? Anyways, what I want to see is just think about the situation that the imam is going through so much difficulty to hide these letters. What is there in these letters that is so concerning? The imam is making a log, opening the log, or like taking a log, opening it, filling it with important letters, and then covering it and hiding it. Clearly, the imam has gone through a lot of difficulty to hide this. It illustrates that there was something significant that was being passed on to the Shias. But also it indicates that the Imams were running this very organized network of representatives. This is, this is a topic that is, you know, research is being done and has been done on it here in Iran. 
They use this term called Sazmane Vikalat. Entire books have been written analyzing the, the Shia community in the latter years of the Imam's lives. It's very, very interesting. Well, all of it indicates that the Imams had other roles to them, a so, so-called social political role where they were growing, organizing the Shia community. You can imagine that when such a community has a lot of money as well due to Khums, there is a lot of potential for political work there that would, of course, cause the government to be very scared. Anyway, so, so far, what have we done? We've looked at a hadith that show how the imams were training the Shias and how they had this network that they had established. They had grown the Shia community and they had established a network that was very much connected and they had representatives. One may say that, okay, this network is just like charitable in its nature. The imams were just trying to give sadaqah money. They were just trying to teach fiqh of the Ahlul Bayt that our fiqh is different from Sunni fiqh. Maybe there was no political nature to it. But I don't think that that's a very strong argument, especially if we keep in mind the kind of interactions that we saw in last week's session that the imams had with the khulafa. No, the imams were very strong taking a stance against the khulafa, and the khulafa knew that as well. The final story, final hadith that I want to narrate with you, dear brothers and sisters, is this one that perhaps you've heard of it before. But it's really, maybe maybe we haven't thought about it that deeply until now. You can see the 10th slide ahead of you now. It's called Rise Up. Yes, okay. In this hadith, somebody by the name of Sadir As-Sayrafi, he says that I came to the 6th Imam, alayhi salam, and I told him, Wallah ma yasa'uka al-qu'ud, that by Allah, you cannot just sit down anymore. The time has come for you, O Imam, to rise up, to take over, to fight, to take the khilafah for yourself. The Imam says, Walima ya Sadir. He said, Why is that the case, O Sadir? Sadir says, Likathrati mawalik wa shi'atika wa ansarik. Wallah, law kana li amir al mu'minin alayhi salam, ma laka min al shi'a wal ansar wa mawali, ma tami'a fihi taymun wala adi. He says, O Imam, look at how many people you have supporting you. Look at how many muali, how many Shia, how many helpers you have. Now you cannot just sit anymore. I swear, but if Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam had this many supporters, nobody would have, none of the enemies would have, you know, thought that they could fight him or overcome him, would have uh, had that desire in their heart against him. So then Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he asked Sadir, Kam asa an yakunu? What do you think is the number of Shias that I have? Sadir, he replies, he says, Mi'at alf, a hundred thousand. And then later he corrects himself, no, Mi'atay alf, two hundred thousand. The Imam says, really? Mi'at alf, Mi'atay alf, really? And then, and then the Imam is quiet for a while, and then he tells Sadir to come with him. And they go somewhere a little bit outside of the city. They come to an area... I skipped over a little bit of the hadith, there's parts that are not that relevant. They come to an area where there is a young man who is with like a flock of animals, maybe sheep. And then Imam says to him, Wallah, ya Sadir, law kana li shi'atun bi'adadi hadha al-jida ma wasa'ani, ma wasa'ani al-qu'ud. That by Allah, O Sadir, if I had this many number, yeah, exactly. Later on, it says half the world as well. So Sadir, he went on, he was maybe somehow exaggerating. Na'am, wa nisfa dunya that, oh, Imam, you have half the world. Anyways, the important point is at the end of this hadith, uh, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he tells Sadir that, look, if I only had this many number, the same number that you see in this flock of animals, if I only had this many number of Shias, I would not have sat down. And then that man, he says that I counted, Sadir, he says, I counted how many there were, and there were only 17. So my, my, my point here is that, look, the imam didn't say that, no, my job is just to teach. Oh, Sadir, why are you telling me that I should go rise up? I'm, my job is to just give people akhlaq. My job is to teach people fiqh in Medina. No, the imam agreed with this idea that if I had the chance, I would have rose up and I would have taken over for myself. So I want to say that we should understand the Imams in this light, that they recognize that their responsibility from Allah was to lead the Muslim Ummah, and they were not just sitting down. 
They were working on preparing the grounds as we saw. Inshallah, our time is now coming to an end. Before we end, I just want to make some concluding remarks that if inshallah we have now understood the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam in this new light, how does that affect us in our day-to-day -day life? How does that change who we are? One thing that I want to say is that, you know, history has a very, very important role in forming our identity. Today in India, the extremist Hindu party in charge is trying to change history that is taught in India to remove any mention of Muslims, to remove the role that Muslims had. Why? Because people like them, they've realized that when you read history, it forms your own identity. The same way we as Shias of the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, if we want to be followers of the Imam, we have to know who the Imams really were. Imagine that somebody is praying namaz at jamaat and they don't know if the imam is in sajda or he's in ruku or he's standing up. How is he going to follow that imam? That's why, for example, over here in the, in the Middle East, we have somebody whose job it is to shout out, you know, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah. He tells everybody that, okay, now it's ruku time. Go to ruku, go to sajda. In the same way, if we want to follow our imams, we have to first of all realize who they were. They were not people who were just teaching akhlaq and teaching aqaid. All that is very, very important. It's the foundation. But they also had this concern for society as a large. They were also reforming their society and building up the groundwork to make a huge reform in their society and establish an Islamic society, a society of true justice in the Islamic sense of the word justice. So that's the first point that we can take away, that we also as Shias of the Ahlul Bayt, we should also have that goal in mind. We should realize that if we are not living in such a society, that's not ideal. And then the other thing is that if we want to be working towards the goal of the Ahlul Bayt, if we want to be true Shias, we need to be working towards the goal of the Ahlul Bayt. This idea that intizar of the Imam Ajrullah Farajuhu Sharif is just to wait and allow the world to be filled with injustice so that he can come and fix it, that's a very, very wrong understanding. Uh, it's a very wrong understanding that if we look at the ahadith, that's not the case at all. We have the 11th Imam in one of his letters, he quoted a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he says, أَفْضَلُ أَعْمَالُ أُمَّتِي إِنْتِظَارُ فَرَجِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى The best of the actions of my ummah is to do intizar. So we see intizar is an action. We need to also be working towards the goals of the Ahlul Bayt, that is to reform society as a large. And the last point, uh, another point that I have here on this last slide is that uh, we have to be in it for the long run. Meaning what? Meaning that the Imams were faced with such difficult situations that we can't even imagine, but they never gave up. They, they tirelessly strove. Their whole life was a life of resistance against oppression. Their whole life was one where they were taking the Shia community forward, passing on the baton, one imam after the other imam. So even us, when we see that the situation in our communities is really, really bad, we see that the law of Allah is being disobeyed everywhere. Nobody has sanctity of the law of Allah. We should never give up. We should learn that inspiration from the imams, alayhim salam to continuously strive to fix ourselves, to fix our society, to fix our family. We know that even in our own selves, to reform ourselves and become a person of taqwa is such a hard task. It requires a lot of effort, it requires help, it requires working with ulama, it requires sabr, patience. It's not going to be an easy task. So in the same way, if we want to reform our society, our community, work towards taking everybody back to the servitude of Allah, it's not going to be an easy task. The last thing that I want to mention is that in this path of reforming society, obviously we need the help of ulama. I'll mention this more, inshallah, if we have the opportunity to meet again in the spring, because there I'll be talking about the role of ulama. But it's needless to say that if we want to be moving in a direction that Allah wants us to move, we need to first of all understand in a profound sense what that direction is. And there we need the help of people who have learned the religion of Islam, 
people who have knowledge and taqwa, people who have implemented that knowledge in their life, and basira as well. So these three ta- uh, qualities, people, ulama who have studied the religion of Allah, ulama who have taqwa as well, they're God-fearing people, they're not going to use the dunya to get their own status, as well as basira, people who have an understanding of the reality. And you know, who is our enemy, who is our friend? We need the help of such ulama to move our communities and ourselves and our families in a direction towards the servitude of Allah. That is the goal of our life at the end of the day, to become a better servant of Allah. We pray that Allah Ta'ala gives us that tawfiq to benefit from these teachings of the Ahlul Bayt salam, and to actually establish it and implement it and work towards these lofty goals. I, uh, again, I thank you for attending this session and I hope it was beneficial. I'm at your service. If you have any questions now or later on, please feel free to be in touch with me. It's an interesting question. Uh, There's an interesting question from Brother Bashir Datu that, okay, I've adopted a certain framework. Would another framework be possible to, that is thematic, group a hadith by key themes? Justice, oppression, human dignity, human rights. Yeah, I, I don't see why not, of course. It, such Such grouping is possible, but it should be done by people who uh, have this overall understanding not that one aspect of the imams gets emphasized more than what is correct but yeah in theory such such groupings are fine in fact a lot of our books of ahadith that's what they are the author of the that book of hadith has categorized the ahadith in a certain way Okay, so thank you very much. Please remember us in your du'as, and if there's no other questions, I will let you go. Okay, one of the sisters also asked a question that, that um, what is the social political role of the 12th Imam during the Ghaiba? Is it correct to say that his social political role will start when he reappears? Or is this role currently played out through the scholar's maraji during the Imam's absence? I think it's very clear, sister, that it is the responsibility of the scholars. Like This is something that we have explicitly in many ahadith and it is something that is always been agreed upon that in the ghaybat of the imam Sharif, his nawab are the fuqaha for example in the bahas of khums from like we we're reading a book of fiqh that was written about 700 800 years ago in that book shahid al awwal when he talks about the saham of the imam in khums he says it goes to the nawab which is understood to be the fuqaha so so basically this goal I think it's very clear that this goal of uh, this role of the imam still applies today. That just because the imam is in ghaiba doesn't mean we allow the enemies of Islam to come and do whatever they want to do. No, there is a certain role that has to be carried out by Muslims, and the the leaders of that in the Islamic dimension at least would be the maraja and the fuqaha and the ulama. Okay. Okay, take care. Iltamasa dua. Khudafis.